Thank you. 
and sorrow will come, and time will be over. Shall rejoice and blossom, 
like the trumpet. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble means. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come to vengeance with terrible recognition. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall weep like a deer, and the tongue of the speech will sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wood, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool in the thirsty brown springs of water. The haunt of jackal shall become a swamp. The grass shall become leaves and brushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall the ground of beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransoms of the Lord shall return and come to the dying of the city. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Our New Testament passage to James, chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. So, brothers, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not judge. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, for us, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord.
we don't often see in our ego-driven, power hungry world. Sadly, it's a kind of loveliness that outsiders sometimes do not see as exemplified in and by our churches. It's a kind of loveliness that newcomers miss from brothers and sisters in Christ's world and fight for position in church meetings. Or when brothers and sisters raise angry voices at each other when it comes to discussing money or plans for the next evangelism event. It's the kind of loveliness that people miss in us when we gossip and talk badly about others behind their backs. John Wesley wrote, Those who love others are so far from making their faults or failings the subject of conversation that they never speak at all about an absent person except to speak favorably. A busybody, slanderous, gossip, or evil speaking is the same as a murderer. One would just as well cut a neighbor's throat as to destroy his or her reputation. And we should be embarrassed even at the thought of speaking badly of another person in their absence. As Wesley, John Wesley, so rightly proclaimed, the love that comes from an intimate and growing relationship with God through Jesus Christ should humble our souls to the dark. It should dissolve all self adulation It should prompt us to rejoice in being the lowest of all, the servant of all. And in the gospel lesson that we just read, Jesus declares, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Even the last least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Okay? God's kingdom and the kingdom of the world are absolute, complete, over all. Okay? The last and is first in God's kingdom. The one who serves rather than the one who is served is the greatest in God's kingdom. How does that fly in our dog's dog world? So many are trapped in dogs where gossip is the native tongue. Pushing others out of the way is the only way to get ahead. Isn't that a miserable existence? But in the kingdom of God, that kind of stuff is the most foolishness of all. In school, kids put on a tough guy or a tough girl in in order to protect themselves and to gain respect from what often appears to be a pack of wolves. People ignore the woman. They're embarrassed to be seen with the unpopular kid who doesn't fit in. But in the kingdom of God, that kind of mess is complete nonsense. In the kingdom of God, the coolest thing one can do is to hang out. To hang out with the loner, or the outcast, or the marginalized. The impossible. And what is the value? In the kingdom of God, we are set free to be truly human and truly humane. And my friends, if you're living as a resurrected follower of Jesus Christ, you are a member of the kingdom of God right here and right now. And the kingdom living is not a mask that we put on when we enter the doors of the church building and take off when we go outside and leave. No, the kingdom of living is no mask 
and on. It's who we are to be and how we are to live at work, at play, at work, at play, at school, everywhere. And when we're not left alone to try and be this way on our own, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is with us every minute and every step of the way. And we can always count on that. When you're faced with a decision, maybe, um, how do I live in this moment as a member of the kingdom of God? You need to stop, pray, and listen. Listen for God's still small voice to lead us on the way and end the way. I know I've heard somebody one time at work at Panera Bread and told, told me that when she started there, the other workers warned her that the Sunday after church shift is an absolutely worse shift. That's when the Christians get out of church. And they're the most rude, arrogant, and demanding of all customers. Isn't that sad? The thing that we have a reputation of the rudest, most arrogant, and demanding of all customers as Christians. The majority of them to be in a horrible mood, she said. The restaurant workers dread working on Sunday when the church crowd comes walking in. You know, it really should alarm us. It should make us very sad. The people that are to represent Jesus Christ God, who humbled himself to the dust and came into this world, was born in a dirty stable and lived as a homeless creature and died as a common criminal, are often seen by the world as the most rude, arrogant, judgmental, non-humble people around. What kind of witness is this? What kind of Christianity is this? There's an air of arrogance surrounding much of the Christian community today. And the world sees it. The world sees it and they're disgusted. And they have a right to be disgusted. They see Christians demanding their right to bring down non-believers at the public square or on the street. And since when were Christians supposed to have rights in this world anyway? John the Baptist didn't have any rights, nor did he demand them. John was beheaded by the king. Jesus didn't have any rights, nor did he demand or claim them. And he told us that we are here, we are to live in the world and not be like the world. We are to turn the other cheek, we're to love our enemies, we're to pray for those who persecute us, and we are to serve. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. This planet is under, under spiritual control of Satan, and Satan is anything but under. We are to have nothing to do with Satan's arrogance. When Christians start acting like a bunch of self-proclaimed martyrs to cry over and throw temper tantrums and when the world wants nothing to do with their manger scenes, their gospel, their morality, Christians start to look like a bunch of arrogant, judgmental, um, extremely worldly, but when Christians, when Christians instead 
take on a Christ-like attitude of services, asking for no lack of honor, place, or for any right, the world responds with admiration. Wasn't this the way that other Teresa lived her life? And has there been a better witness for the kingdom of God and the way that Christ and our Savior from Calcutta in the past 1,500 years and yet to put on our gospel lessons in a more modern that context and tell you the truth, the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than she there's a book that was entitled Unchristian, and the author writes a young generation of outsiders is raising significant criticism of the Christian faith and its people. How do we respond to this? How do we respond to something like that as Christians? What will we do to address the unchristian perception? of our faith. How will we respond to what outsiders think of us? And if people say that we no longer look like the people Jesus intended, what do we do about it? And this question that is in itself should humble us, I think. We need to be intentional in shifting our reputation. We must learn to respond to people the way Jesus did. And we need to be defined by our service and our sacrifice, by lives that exclude, exclude, exclude humanity, humility, and grace. If outsiders can't see Jesus in us, if we can't see Jesus in us and in our lives, then we need to solve our hidden Jesus problem. And this might be the hardest thing. The truth is that we all have much to learn. And the more mature we are in our faith, and I'll tell you here, right here, we've got a lot of maturity. The more mature we are in our faith, the more we are able to see our need to grow. According to a survey, mature believers, and I'm not talking our age, and stop and believers. The church believers are more likely to identify their weaknesses and believe me, I have Because they are able to see themselves more clearly in the light of God's standards. They don't fool themselves. So one of the most important things we can do is to mature in our faith. And how do we do that? How do we do that? We do it. We respond to the people the way Jesus did. And we have that opportunity right here, right now. One of the most effective ways to learn how to respond to people the way that Jesus did is to read the Bible. Read the the Bible daily. Every day. And if you don't like the version you have, go get a different version. If it's hard to understand or slow to read, get a different person. There's so many different, fantastic versions. Get easy to understand the modern day contemporary language. Does that one suit you better? Go good. Come to Bible study. That Bible study that speaks on men to even each other work for you on time life or sleep life. And start longer. Go to another Bible study somewhere else. Fix your schedule there. <laughs> Sunday sun school. <laughs> and if the class that you uh, are presently offered um, doesn't meet what, the, what you like, go to something else that suits you better. Talk to your teachers. Sunday sun school and if the class is there on what you want, talk to them and see if we can do another study. I'm not sure that Christians should even go to restaurants or any other places on a business on Sunday. But we do. It's convenient. And 
I was going out to get me. We lived on the farm. We kept going there. We ate at home. And we did buy this. We said, I don't have somewhere to go that day. We never did come where we were going to have on a Sunday dinner. But the Christians who said eight at home and in one night another's home on Sunday, the persons who have to work in the restaurants on Sunday find out the opportunity to experience the great privilege that we enjoy of going to church, coming to church on Sunday morning, to work with God. Let's not do anything that can come between people and a personal relationship. With Jesus Christ. And if we do, there might be a sin. See, we are to live lives that excuse humility and break. We are to serve others. We are not to be caught up in the world of politics, in the world of anything. Instead, we are to live our lives in order to point the way to Jesus Christ. That's it. Every one of us who call ourselves Christian must be involved in some ministry. And that's another reason to become a part of the nature with hands on the earth. But beyond that, we each need to be actively involved in a ministry in the church. In this church. What is God calling you to do and, and here? Through St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. What is God calling you to do to serve our community? You and closet, sending praises to God, going out and helping with the ringing of the bells at Christmas. What is God calling us to do in our ministry at home? What about the way we're treating our families or our neighbors and are we to move our ministry into our places of employment or our schools as we build relationships for outsiders or give us an opportunity to see how a Christian faces and deals with the problems that are common to every person? God is, God is concerned. He's concerned about our response to criticism, about teaching us, about helping shape us into the kinds of people that God can do. Now, I'll tell you one thing. This past year has been tough. It's been tough for me. I know it's been tough for others. God is concerned about our response and our reactions. And when it comes to our reactions with outsiders, we need to realize that our relationships and our interactions with people and the way we need to react or the way we don't react are humility or lack thereof comprise the picture of Jesus that people maintain. God has wired people, human beings, so that spiritual influence occurs most commonly for relationships. And relationships are important. Our relationships here are very important. One thing that turns people on is on to Jesus is humility. And what turns people off is arrogance and an aura of Deserving for times and privileges. Just for a spiritual and intellectual enterprise, I suggest that you take a look at the letters of to the editor and Facebook comments, other social media. And as you read these comments and letters that come from Christians, Put yourself in the shoes of someone who knows little about Christianity and ask why. What kind of picture does this paint of Jesus follows? If we say nasty things about atheists or persons of other faith, are we responding to this folks of Jesus? As Jesus would respond to these folks, we need to humble ourselves. 
Let's not claim to have a good mind. Let's stop demanding what the world knows that the world knows for some reason. Because as Christians, we are to live as aliens in this world, not as those who control it. We are to be concerned about the popular way to live in God's kingdom, not Satan's kingdom. We are to be humble. We are to live like Jesus Christ. James, the brother of Jesus, and the first bishop of the Christian church, right in James chapter 2, that faith without action is useless, and that even the demons believe in God. The thing that causes the devil to truly tremble is when Christians live as Jesus will. Which is something that goes to the contrary to the way of the world. That the world is forced to sit up and take notice, having a great respect, almost everyone respects Jesus. But many of us do not respect his representative. That's us. But they will if we are serious, as John the Baptist is serious, in saying that Jesus has become more. I must become that. And this is some kind of humility. This is the kind of humility, this is the kind of loveliness that we, as the body of Christ, live to accept us in. And then we will have so a great joy. Jesus must become greater. He must become that every day. This is a time of year that joy has to be spread. We must spread that joy to everyone that we need. What is a smile? A handshake? You see someone with names? Good talk to them. Help with the three senses. Help with the and the fuel project. Got a lot of hungry children in this neighborhood. In this in our community. How can we have joy for hungry? So I just today I, I just feel the need to bring that joy to others in this group. Dear God, enable us to be humble to yourself by your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May we become serious about maturing in our faith. May we let our souls be filled with humility which leads to kindness, gentleness, endurance, and patience for everyone. Let everything within us thirst for you, the living God, and may we long to be awakened into your likeness and to be satisfied with this. May we become true lovers of you and of all humankind, and in this spirit do and endure all things for the sake of the lost and dying world, world, which you love and came and died to save. In Jesus' name, for his sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, the essence will come forward.
idea is the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Lord, we do thank you that 
we have this program and the church here, the students and outreach. We thank you for the giving of this and the soul of these people that help in all ways to come. We help you to and in terms of all the struggles that we have here. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for those that are teachers that are facing these young kids and young young people every day, help them to get through each day. Help our people that are always um, in the restaurants and people might say nice. Help us if we go to the restaurant to be thankful and to be good and we go to the Getting up your day to serve others. Lord, give us the joy of the season. The joy that we know that as we await the coming of the return Again, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have given us. And now we ask, Lord, that you. That we, as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, I love you, God, and I'll be your God, and I love you, God, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us not of the temptation. That the Lord has shown you, but I am the King and the power and the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, this is my gift song, don't know very well, so I'm going to start out with the previous one. We're going to sing it to a CD. So if you'll stand with me and sing, and then the face is playing, it's 2095.